Uh, Commissioner, the next witness is Mr McNaughton from National Australia Bank. Thank you, Mr. I expect Mr McNaughton, who's outside the court, will be with us uh, immediately. I'm trying to get out of the habit of saying he's outside the court, uh, <laughs> outside the room. Indeed. Indeed, Commissioner. Old habits die very hard, Mr <laughs> Thomas. They do indeed. Mr McNaughton, uh, you were sworn or affirmed last time we were here. Uh, well, not here, last time uh, in the Commission, I think. I'm right, am I not, Mr Thomas? Yes, and that uh, uh, the promises then made continue. If you'd be good enough to sit down. Thank you, Mr McNaughton. Yes, Mr Thomas. Yes, sir. I'll uh, just let the uh, yes. uh, person from your instructors assemble all the... Grateful papers yes, that have been uh, assembled. Yes, yes, Mr. Thomas. Uh, your full name is Ross Hugh McNaughton. Yes, it is. And your business address is 500 Burke Street, Melbourne. Yes, it is. And your current position is General Manager, Strategic Business Services, National Australia Bank Limited. Yes, it is. Um, now, Mr McNaughton, have you received a summons uh, to appear and give evidence at this round of hearings of the Commission? Yes, I have. Uh, do you have the original of that summons with you in the witness box? I do, yes. Uh, I tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.111, summons to Mr McNaughton. Now, Mr. McNaughton, you have prepared two witness statements uh, for this round of hearings. Yes, I have. The first of those statements is dated 18 June 2018. Yes, that's correct. And do you have the original of that statement with you? Yes, I do. Uh, now, I understand you wish to make one correction to that statement. Yeah, yes, please. And you've made that amendment in handwriting on the statement. Yes, I have. Uh, can I direct your attention to paragraph 113 of that statement? Do you have that? I do, yes. And you wish to correct the word fixed to the to flexible? Yes, I do. Uh, can you please initial the change in the margin? With that change, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, I tender that statement and its exhibit. Exhibit 4.112, the witness statement of Mr McNaughton, 18 June 18, with exhibits. Uh, Mr McNaughton, your second statement in this round of hearings is dated 25 June 2018. Yes, it is. Do you have the original of that statement with you? I do, yes. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. I attend to that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.113, supplementary statement of Mr McNaughton, 25 June 18. Commission pleases. Thank you, Mr Thomas. Yes, Mr Costello. <laughs> Mr McNaughton, you're the Head of Strategic Business Services at NAB? Yes, I am. And Strategic Business Services is a euphemism for stressed or defaulted business loans. Is that right? Yes, it is. That's the work of your unit? Yes, it is. And you've been in that role for a little over 12 months? Yes, that's correct. And before that, you were the Managing Director of NAB UK Commercial Real Estate? In London, yes. In London. Um, is that an insolvency-related function? Uh, no, it's not. OK. Had you been in other insolvency-related functions before you took your current role? Yes, I had. All right. And were they in Australia or in the UK? In the UK. OK. Um, you have 80 bankers in your team and they're um, most commonly described as impaired asset managers, is that right? Yes, that's correct. OK. 
So an impaired asset manager is a banker who's dealing with a distressed loan. Yes, that's right. Okay. And your team includes agri-specialists? Yes, it does. And how does one become an agri-specialist impaired asset manager? Um, generally, that's through previous involvement um, with agriculture and banking. Uh, writing loans, for example, to farmers? Yes, or in uh, or, uh, credit function. Or in credit, okay. And are the agri-specialists organised into a separate team within your team, a sub-team of SBS, if I can call Strategic Business Services SBS? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And there are 10 agri-specialists insolvent, uh, impaired asset managers within that team, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And is that team responsible for handing all of NAB's distressed loan portfolio for agricultural customers? Um, the majority of them. Um, there are some which, uh, which aren't, uh, but generally uh, all up to what we farm gate would be managed in SBS by one of those, the agri-specialised team. All right. And that's the team that currently has um, Mr and Mrs Smith's file uh, under their supervision? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, NAB has a very significant market share in agribusiness lending. You agree with that? Yes, I do. All right, and it's got a particularly high share in Queensland? Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, if, uh, you provide some uh, figures to the Commission in your statement, which is your first statement, rather, which is WIT 0001 0069 0001. And if we could go to paragraph 21, which is on the seventh numbered page, could that table be blown up, please? This is the total number of agricultural customers for NAB for each year since 2008, for the year ending the 30th of June, Australia-wide. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so the numbers have been fairly static, but um, almost always at or about 20,000 agricultural customers. Yes, that's correct. And then at paragraph 18 of your statement, you give some figures about um, rural branches and rural bank managers. This table uh, on the screen now is the number of branch managers employed in rural areas broken down by state and territory. Uh, uh, no, sorry, the, the one that's on your screen now is the uh, number of branches operating in rural areas broken down by state and territory. And you can see the first column's Queensland and there's 57. And there's more in Queensland than any other state and in total at April 2018 NAB has 177 branches operating in rural areas. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then if you um, move to the, ta to the table in paragraph 18 on the next page, this is the table that gives the number of branch managers in rural and regional locations broken down by state and territory. Um, you'll recall that in 2018, I just pointed out that there are 177 rural branches. Um, why is it that, that for 177 rural branches there would be only 120 rural branch managers? Do some people manage more than one branch? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have responsibility for the, the agriculture business book. Okay. But it's right, isn't it, that when a file comes into your group, an agricultural file, the, as a general proposition at least, the um, impaired asset manager from SBS will work with the 
existing relationship manager for the bank customer who's in distress. Is yes, that that's right? correct. It's not that the file is transferred into your group and the relationship manager ceases to have any involvement in the file? No, that, yeah. Okay. Um, in August uh, last year, APRA brought in a new reporting standard, ARS 750. Are you familiar with that? Uh, for the purposes of this, I am familiar with it. You learnt about it because yes. of this statement? All right. Um, it uh, relates to agricultural lending and default. You That's appreciate what I understand, that? yes. And this was a measure brought in by APRA so that um, there could be on the public record, well, th there could be available to APRA at least um, better data in terms of the size and scope of agricultural lending and the amount of enforcement activity in relation to agricultural loans. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, it is. All right. Um, can I take you to your response to APRA, which is NAB? dot double zero five dot four double eight dot triple zero one It, it is. It's the, it's the fourth tab to exhibit two of Mr. McNaughton's yeah, just statement. Just if he needs access to it, he's got a yes. hard copy there. Is that yes. right? It's tab four. Tab four to your first statement, Mr. McNaughton. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, Mr. McNaughton, you're no doubt much more proficient at spreadsheets than I am. Um, what I want to understand from looking at this spreadsheet is the size of uh, the NAB's agricultural lending and the facility limits available to agricultural customers in different segments. Have you looked at this spreadsheet before now? Not prior to putting my statement together. Okay, but you had a look at it before you signed your statement? Yes. Perhaps. Um, it says at the top, scale factor, banks millions of dollars to three decimal places. Can you see that? Yes, I do. So then, say to take the first cell by example, it's in New, it's New South Wales beef cattle. Applying the scale, what is that number there? $756 million. That's the total outstanding balance yes. in loans to the NAB relating to beef cattle in New South Wales alone. All right. And we can see the equivalent for Queensland. Um, if the operator scrolls down a little. I'm 42. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner. Your, yours doesn't have numbers there, Mr McNaughton, because like me, you've got a PDF version, but it's the first cell on the second page. Yes. Um, so that is the number for beef cattle loans in Queensland. That, that's $2.747 billion, is it? Um, sorry, that's... Sorry, I'm just struggling to follow the number there. Sorry. Oh, is the version that you're looking at, Mr. Thank you, David. Is the version you're looking at, say, instead of 2747, does the version that you have in front of you say 2521? It does, yes. I see. Uh, so does mine. Um, mine doesn't. Uh, I think. I win, Mr. Costello. <laughs> to say bingo, um, the, the reason is that there are two of these. Um, the reporting standard's only been in for one year. Uh, you had to produce these figures to APRA for the 2017 year, but 
most banks now have included, went back and did the calculation for the 2016 year and provided that to APRA on a voluntary basis. And the one that's been brought up on the screen is, uh, I think, for the earlier year. I can just as easily use that one. The one that's on the screen is, in fact, tab three, uh, tab three to your statement. <coughs> See there now on the second page, the number is the same number as on the screen, two seven four seven. Yes, it is. So that's is that two point seven four seven billion dollars worth of beef cattle loans in Queensland that NAB has. Yes, that's correct. All right, and then it's got the equivalent numbers for uh, other types of agricultural activity in Queensland down the page, but um, by far the largest is beef cattle with a total outstanding balance as I just said of over 2.7 billion and the second column there is total facility limits of 3.36 billion. Then the next column across is total value of loans more than 90 days past due. Uh, 0.073. Yes. And then the total number of borrowers is the last column, which is 2022 beef cattle borrowers in Queensland with $2.747 billion worth of outstanding balances on facility limits of $3.36 billion. Yes. And would you agree that the amount that is uh, past 90 days due is a very, very small amount compared to the total lending? Yes, it is. Do you, in your role as head of SBS, have an understanding of the relative impairments to total loans of different aspects of NAB's business? Um, in general terms? I, I don't in general figures. terms, yes, I do. So in general terms, you gave evidence um, in the last hearing block in relation to small business lending. Um, would you expect that in relation to general small business lending, the ratio of loan, of loan value over 90 days to total lending would be more or less or about the same than this? Um, Queensland cattle I'm speaking about specifically. Yeah, I, I would expect it to be the same. The same? Yeah. So the percentage of borrowers, if you call past 90 days due as default um, for the purpose of this exercise, the percentage of um, borrowers in default and the total value um, of facilities in default is a very, very small fraction of the total lending of the bank. Yes, that's correct. All right. Otherwise, you'd need a lot more than 80 staff in your team. Um, You've made some observations about that data in paragraph 25 of your statement, if that could come back up. That's the WIT 0001 0069, no sorry, 0069, yeah, thank you. Um, par paragraph 25 of that document. This is you um, making some comment on the APRA data. Yes, is that that's right? Correct, yes. Um, and you say in 25A, the data shows, for example, that as at 30 June 2016, in all states and territories, less than half of 1% of the agricultural borrowers had a loan which was more than 90 days past due being a total of 62 customers? Yes. The highest total value of loans past 90 days due was in New South Wales, 14.95 million, followed by Victoria, 8 million. And, the, and out of the total value of loans past 90 days due, the majority was in the following industries, New South Wales, grain growing and mixed grains, livestock and cotton, Victoria, grain growing and mixed grains, livestock, 
beef, cattle and dairy. Do you have any idea why those particular market segments in those states have the highest amount of uh, loans past 90 days due? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Is that something that your agribusiness specialists within SBS would try and work out? Whether there are trends where particular industries are defaulting at higher rates? Yes, they would. Or they would do that? Their function's not just to manage a file that comes into them, they do look to trends, is that right? No, if, if they were managing um, numerous uh, files in the same part of the sector, then I think it'd be reasonable to expect they would say, they, they would raise a concern. I see. But this type of interrogation that you've set out at 25, that's not the common practice, that's something you've done for the purpose of preparing this statement? Yes, that that's right? correct. Okay, that's fine. Um, do you think that you're a banker that's worked in the, I don't mean this pejoratively, the sales side and the, now the bad debt side of the business, do you think that less than 0.5% uh, of agricultural borrowers with a loan more than 90 days past due is consistent with default rates in other areas of the business? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. All right. You give the number of um, agribusiness lenders that, uh, sorry, agribusiness um, clients uh, referred to SBS each year in your statement at paragraph 30 in a table from 2008 to 2017. This is on page 11 of that, yeah, there it is. Um, can see the peak in that 10 year cycle is 2013 at 154. And in the last year that you've given figures for 95 clients referred to SBS? Yes. And so the, these files, um, the 95 new files that need to be managed by the 10 agribusiness specialists that sit within your, in your team are in addition to any files that haven't been resolved within the, the earlier time. So while there's been 95 referrals into your group, it doesn't mean that there'd be 95 files for the agribusiness specialists to manage because they'd have existing files as well. Yes, that's correct. And sometimes is that, I'm not sure within NAB, is that referred to as churn? The um, files coming in and then leaving SBS? Or do you have your own term for it? Historically, that's a term that's been used in Australia. All right. Yes, okay. And what's the churn rate within SBS generally? Um, it's approximately 75%. Is that resolved within 12 months? Is that what that means? 75% um, of referrals that come in are resolved within 12 months, or does it mean something else? It's of files that are referred in and accepted by SBS, 75% of them are rehabilitated back to the, um, the performing book where SBS are no longer involved. I see. So they're repatriated back to the business? Yes. And do you have an idea of the average time that it takes for a file to be repatriated? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, do you have a feel for whether or not, on average, it would take longer for an agribusiness file to be repatriated than an, an, another type of file? No, I, I'm sorry, I don't. You know about Mrs Smith's file from preparing your statement. Is that a file that um, has been in SBS for an unusually long time? Yes, I, I believe so. Would there be many files that sit within SBS for five years or more? Um, I'm not aware of the specific number of files. But would there be many? Uh, I don't think so. Do you monitor that? Is the time that a file sits within SBS a relevant metric that you're interested in? No, it's not. It's not. All right. That a point at which to break off. Thank you, Commissioner Costello.
2 p.m. Is that going to be? Yes, we'll, we'll finish. With, we'll finish within time if we resume at 2. Okay. 2 p.m. Then. Mr McNaughton, customers are referred from other parts of the bank to SBS, is that right? Yes, it is. And SBS is independent from the business side of the bank and also independent from the credit function of the bank, is that correct? Yes, it is. And is SBS obliged to accept a referral? Uh, yes, in so far as um, to review a file. But not to, not to assume management of a file? Un yes. Unless SBS is satisfied of particular matters. Is that how it works? Yes, it is. Um, you mention in your statement at paragraph 39 um, that an agricultural customer may be referred to SBS through a review of the customer's customer rating system, which is referred to as CRS or ECRS. Could you just explain the ECRS system? Um, sorry, what, the... E ECRS? Yes. What is that a measure of? It's, um, it's a measure of the, um, the customer's credit rating based on a probability of default. And is that a rating given out of 100? Uh, no, so the rating, um, the rating works as 1 through to 23 and then ECRS 98 and 99, which are in the default ratings. Did you say 1 to 20? One to, sorry, 1 to 23. 1 to 23 yes. are not in default file? Files not in default? Correct. And then 98 or 99 files in default? So nine, yes, 98 is default no loss, and 99 is where we've made an assessment that it's in default and the bank's likely to incur a loss. And there's some reference in some of the documents, and I'm not sure if it's in connection with ECRS or something else, of a rating that is NALS? <coughs> yes. What's that mean? Uh, uh, Non-accrual loan. Non-accrual loan? Yes. And is that necessarily a loan that's 98 or 99? That would be an ECRS 99. 99. And what, so what does it mean, in effect, for something to be um, NALS? What, how is that different to ECRS of 99? Um, it, it, it's the same thing, it just means we're no longer taking interest to profit. No longer taking interest to profit? Yes. All right. Um, so you, you said that uh, files are referred to SBS from other parts of the business. Can I take you to NAB 005-514? triple zero one. This is tab thirty eight of your first statement, Mr McNaughton, if you'd like to work from the hard copy. <coughs> this is a document headed referral form for categorization. Is this the form that the, a business uh, unit needs to complete in order to refer a file from the business into SBS? Yes, it was the form, that version of the form at that time. At that time. And this um, form is from August 2012 and relates to um, Mr and Mrs Smith? Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. And um, this form has been submitted by who? By the banker. Is that Drew Rolf? Yes, it is. And you see that name on the bottom of the second page. All right. Um, and the banker put some comments in the background and current status. And you can see there that he says beef cattle breeding. <coughs> this is in answer to what the business or model business model and operations are beef cattle breeding, applicants breed Brahmin cross steers and heifers for the feeder market, 
Cull cows from operation are sold direct to works for slaughter. They've got a dozer um, for in close proximity to Pentland where th that they can earn up to $20,000 a month from at that point in time. It's not the main focus of their enterprise, but it's the key to their cash flow. And then it says what's changed. Applicants have been unable to get cattle to market due to wet weather conditions. Applicants have been extremely unlucky as they now had to postpone selling weaners through agents or cows to meat works due to wet weather. This has delayed cash flow leading to applicants missing interest due and schedules in their facilities. So this is the first time that um, your part of the bank comes into contact with the Smiths, is that correct? Yes, as I understand it. Yes. And it's then um, up to somebody within your unit to decide whether or not to assume management of the file? Yes, that's correct. And do you remember what decision was made in response to this? That the file should remain with the banker without SBS's involvement. All right. And why was that decision made? From my review of it, um, of the of the subsequent correspondence, um, it was because the, um, there was likely to be um, future cash flow to rectify the situation. So in that circumstance, the file just stays with the um, relationship manager, and that's the end of SBS's involvement in it. Is that correct? Typically, yes. Okay. Now, one of SBS's roles is to manage the hardship process for some types of borrowers, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that includes agricultural borrowers? Yes, that's correct. And that's because they're a special, what's called within NAB a specialised form of banking, specialised business? Yes. All right. Um, now, when something comes to SBS like this that speaks about applicants being unable to get cattle to market due to wet weather conditions and that has got them to the state where they're missing repayments and the banker thinks that it might be necessary to submit the file to the management of SBS because it's turning into a distressed debt. Is there any trigger within your group for um, the borrower to be notified about a hardship process? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, when you say not that you're aware of, do you mean not that you're, you're aware of insofar as 2012 is concerned, or do you mean now? In, in 2012. And what about now? Um, no, I'm not aware that there's a specific um, requirement for SBS to, um, to contact the customer specifically on hardship. Uh, is it likely you would be aware if there was such a requirement? Um, Yes, I think I would be. All right. Now, even if there's not a requirement, is there any sort of process or direction? It might not be a requirement, but is there some way that it would ordinarily happen that um, a person in the situation of the Smiths in August 2012 who had been struck by flood and it had affected their business and their ability to service their interests would be referred to a hardship process? Yes. it's. I, I look at that as being the... the the general requirement of the job of an impaired asset manager is to consider the circumstances that's led through to the referral of the customer to SBS and make an assessment of what the situation is. So how common would it be for an agricultural file to come into SBS at NAB without having first been through a hardship process? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Does NAB commonly tell <coughs> borrowers about the hardship process or is it for borrowers to ascertain that there is one and act on it in their own right? Um, I, again, I, I'm not involved with the, with the, the front book um, with bankers, so I, I don't know what the processes are there, I'm sorry. Um, but I thought that you had just agreed with me that it was your unit's role to conduct the hardship process in so far, far as it concerned agricultural clients. Where they've been referred to SBS. Only where they've been referred yes. to SBS. All right. Um, what about uh, in the situation, as we just saw in August, where there's been an attempt to refer, but SBS has declined to take the file? Would SBS have any role in the hardship process there? 
nor ridden hut. All right. Um, so it would then be incumbent upon the client's banker to tell them about the hardship process. Is that how it would work? Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Um, would you have any expectation that the person within SBS who reviews the referral form would, when declining the file, suggest to the banker um, in explaining why it's been declined that they might consider hard, referring the client to a hardship process? Um, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Is it fair to say that hardship is a very minor aspect of the SBS, of SBS's role, administering the hardship process in respect of those clients to whom it applies is a minor role within your group? Yes, I think that's fair. Um, but wouldn't it also be the case, just by nature of the fact that the clients that are referred to your file are clients in financial distress, that they are most obviously the ones in need of at least consideration of a hardship process. Um, sorry, could you say that again? Sorry. It's fine. Isn't it more likely, by reason of the fact that the clients with whom your group deals are clients in financial distress, that they are likely to be clients that would be in need of a hardship process? <coughs> uh, yes. And uh, again, the way that I, I suppose I consider that is that by virtue of a, of a customer being referred to SBS means there is some issue in the background where there is, there's likely to be an element of financial stress. Mm -hmm. And that as part of that, the, the impaired asset manager um, would review the, review the background and review the circumstances to establish um, what the situation is. Um, and if in, if in their view that hardship had or was a feature, then I think they would they would act appropriately with that. Well, shouldn't that just be part of the mandatory requirements on review of a file coming into SBS? Wouldn't that be the natural and sensible way to deal with hardship in a serious way is to consider it when you're first considering taking the file into the section of the bank that deals with borrowers in distress? Um, yes. But that's not something you're doing now. Only where the files refer to SBS. Uh, but not always where the files refer to SBS, is, I, is what I thought your evidence was. Well, um, where, um, where, the file, where the files refer to SBS will always follow the same review process, um, not necessarily with a hardship lens on it. It would be a, a general try to understand what the situation is. And if hardship... I, was recognised as having occurred or being, you know, occurring, then I would expect the, the impaired asset manager to flag it accordingly. But I think you accepted earlier that it's not, there's no requirement for the impaired asset manager on reviewing it to refer or perhaps even consider referring mm -hmm. to a hardship process at the moment. It's not a requirement within your business that that be done. Um, sorry, I, I think I misunderstood your, your earlier your earlier question. So when a file comes to SBS, um, we would review the circumstances as to why it's been referred. And as part of that referral, if hardship was identified, then we are required to flag that in our system um, and then um, act in accordance with our, our hardship policy. So you, you are, in fact, required yes, sorry, to flag I, I the hardship? Yes, I misunderstood. Yes. All right. Um, and is that only for files accepted, or if it, is it as happened in August when a file is reviewed, but you decline to take over management of the file? Is there any flagging process in those circumstances? Uh, no, there aren't. Right. So that's a gap, isn't it? Well, to the extent that a file was referred and it was reviewed, I wouldn't expect the file then to be passed back to the business if hardship was present. All right. Were you in court for more Mrs Smith's evidence? I wasn't in court, but I saw you the saw evidence. It. Did, you, did you hear her answer that she is not at any stage, to her recollection, being advised of any hardship process by anybody at NAB? Yes, I did. And were you surprised to hear that? Uh, no, I'm not. 
why are you not surprised? Um, I don't necessarily think that, um, when, on my review of the file, that um, the circumstances are hardship. Um, it was first offered to SBS in August 2012 because they were having trouble servicing the loan because there'd been a flood that prevented them selling cattle. On the 1st of January 2013, drought was declared in the Flinders Shire Council where their uh, fattening property, Limbury, is. And Limbury has been in continuous drought since the 1st of January 2013, and you don't think that that is a file that warrants even a consideration of hardship? Uh, no, I, I, in my review of the file, I looked at that as business viability rather than solely as hardship. Well, what, if five years of drought doesn't invoke hardship, what does? Um, yeah, I, th there are a number of um, circumstances set out in our, our, our policy which are examples, but not exclusively hardship. All right. Can I show you NAB.005.291.2013? Is this the policy that you're referring to? I'm sorry, can you tell me which tab that is, please? Oh, sorry. Um, actually, I think this is a version that's not in your tabs. You'll, you'll have to look. There, there is a version in your tabs. Okay. And whether or not there's any material difference between this one and the one that's in your tab, I'm not sure. But does this document look familiar? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Um, can you tell... You, I, I don't think you can tell from the face of the document the dates that this document... No, I'm sorry, for. I can't. That's all right. <laughs> You've been handed a hard copy of the document on the screen, have you? All right. This is the policy, at least at some point in time, that applied to your business, the business for which you're responsible within the bank's strategic business services. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And if you turn to... The third page, which was is triple zero four. Second line there says hardship refers to a customer's difficulty in meeting their obligations, which is generally on a temporary basis, after which they are able to resume making repayments as per normal. Now, perhaps that what that's what you had in mind when you said you consider this to be viability, not hardship, because this is no longer a temporary situation. Is that what you meant? Uh, in the case of the Smiths, yes. Yes. Um, that wasn't the case in August 2012 when it was first referred to SBS, was it? No, I, I don't believe it was. And it wasn't the case later in 2012 when the file was again referred to SBS and SBS assumed the management of the file. Sorry, what, what wasn't? All right. Do you remember when SBS took conduct yes. of the file? Do you I remember do. that that was later in 2012? I do, yes. Yes. At the time that SBS accepted the referral of the file, you couldn't have said that that was a viability issue, could you, with confidence? <coughs> um, no, I, I, um, I, I, th I think it could have been. Do you think it was? Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. All right. Um, it says then, underneath the paragraph I just took you to, hardship notice is the act of a customer providing us with information about their situation. Um, so that's what a hardship notice is, a customer providing you with information about their situation. Is there any obligation in this document on anybody within SBS to tell a customer that a hardship process exists? Uh, no, there isn't. Why isn't there? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Okay. Um, are you you are responsible for the administration of this policy? Is that correct? To the extent it um, it's a requirement on SBS, yes. Well, it's entitled SBS Hardship Procedural. Is there anyone else it could apply to? Uh, no, there isn't. This is exclusively the hardship policy for the part of the bank that you run? Yes, that's correct. 
And are you responsible for the content of it? Uh, yes, I am. And have you made a conscious decision not to have a requirement in here for a bank officer to tell somebody that a hardship policy exists, or is it something you've just not thought about? Uh, I haven't made um, that assessment. Do you think it would be a fair thing to let people know that there is a hardship policy, just to let them know of the fact that there is a policy that they might be able to avail themselves of some assistance under? Yes, I think that's something we could do. All right. And then it says there are some of the more common hardship causes leading to a referral, and it includes in the second column natural, natural disasters. And would you class drought as a natural disaster? In, in my view, yes, it is. In the way this policy is administered by the bank, is drought considered a natural disaster? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I'm not sure that I can accept that answer. You are the person who is responsible for the unit within the bank that is responsible for administering this policy. It applies exclusively to the unit of the bank that you run. How can you not know the answer to whether or not you and your staff would consider drought to be a natural disaster within the meaning of this policy? I consider it to be in my view. I don't know if, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's individual views across other people. Is there just discretion in whoever the person's desk it lands on to decide the hardship application as to how they apply this policy? No, there isn't. Well, then, how do you get any consistency of approach to a fairly fundamental question like the one I just asked you? Does drought come within natural disaster? I haven't specifically asked across our agribusiness managers for their views on on drought as being a natural disaster. My view, as I said, is that it is. Um, and I would expect that when any impaired asset manager does a review, that they uh, consider whether hardship applies. All right. And is it any role um, of yours to give direction to your staff about this, how this policy applies? Uh, I haven't done that yet. Right. Do you think that's a mistake? No, I don't. Why don't you think that's a mistake? Um, because I think the I think the policy is sufficient. Notwithstanding that you were unwilling to give me a definitive answer about whether natural disaster includes drought, you think the policy is sufficient? Yes, I do. All right. If we could turn to 0008. You see there, assisting customers who experience financial hardship is important to the bank as it can help to protect the bank's reputation and retain customers, reduce instances of bankruptcy, reduce bad and doubtful debts, prevent the write-off of bad debts and comply with our regulatory requirements under our banking licence. Do you agree that there are good reasons to robustly implement a hardship policy in the bank's own interests? Yes, I do. And it is one of those circumstances where the robust implementation of a policy in the bank's own interests will ordinarily coincide with the interests of the bank's customer? Yes. Do you think that you need to do more as a unit within SBS to administer your hardship policy? No, I don't. You think that what you're doing at the moment is sufficient? Yes, I do. Notwithstanding that there's no requirement to even let a customer know that it exists? Yes, I, I think we have a sufficient policy. Why do you think it's sufficient to have a policy but not to tell a customer about it? Doesn't it strike you as an odd thing to say? No, it doesn't. Why is that? <coughs> the impaired asset managers across the, the business are, are experienced and there's a sufficient level of oversight of what they do when a file reaches SBS that um, I have sufficient comfort that if hardship was present, then it would be considered. 
And how do you know that? That's your impression? That's my experience in my time in SBS. How many hardship applications does SBS receive each year? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Would you be able to... Do you know how many files SBS receives a year? I, I, again, I, I don't know that number. Um, do you know how... You don't know how many agricultural files you receive each year? No, I don't. I think we... Um, Just to indicate, um, my friend has asked... Mr. McNaughton, about the number of files, agricultural files referred I'm to just, SBS on an I'm just about after. to take him to it. I'm grateful to my friend. Um, you may not be able to recall now, Mr. McNaughton, but earlier we spoke about how many agricultural files are referred to your unit each year and we spoke about churn. Do you remember that? I do, but that's not the number of files referred, that's the number of files accepted. I see. So you draw a distinction between those where there has been a referral and it's been rejected and those that have been accepted as SBS files? Yes. OK. All right. Um, so, for example, in 2017, the figures in your statement show that in 2017 you accepted 95 agricultural files. Yes, that's correct. Now, would it be fair to say that a number of those files at least would... Um, be distressed borrowers because of climatic events? I'm sorry, I don't know that. How many um, years have you been in SBS? Um, I've been in Australia since May 2017. And do you meet as part of your ordinary work with the specialised agribusiness team within your group? Yes, I do. Oh, with the group as a whole or with the leaders? Um, with, the, with the leader. Right. And do they communicate with you about the files that have been accepted into their part of SBS? Yes, they do. And do they communicate with you the types of files they're seeing and the reasons they're seeing them coming through? Yes, they do. And when they're having these conversations with you, do they ever express to you anything about drought, flood, pestilence? Yes, they'll talk about general market conditions. So you have a general awareness that there are at least some files that come into SBS that are there for reason, some agricultural files that come into SBS that are, are there by reason of, at least in part, a natural disaster. Yes. Yes, all right. And But you don't know how many of those are the subject of an application for hardship relief? No, I'm sorry. I and don't. you don't know how many of those the customer was told that there is a hardship process that they might avail themselves of. Yeah, again, I'm sorry, I don't. All right, thank you. Since you took over the leadership of SBS, have you become aware of the farm debt mediation process? Yes, I have. Um, you understand that that is a legal requirement in three states that must be adhered to before a bank is capable of enforcing a farm mortgage? Yes. All right. And would you expect, as a general proposition, that before um, farm debt mediation proceeds, that um, a client might have been advised of hardship policy? Sorry, I, I missed Would you expect, as a general proposition, that before a notice is sent requiring a farm debt mediation that a client would have been made aware of a hardship policy? Um, I, I'm not aware that that we would send a notice of a, of a hardship policy prior to farm debt mediation, but it would be part of the assessment that the impaired asset manager would make. Okay. But there's no policy, just I, I want to be sure... To notify, this. correct. Um, the Smiths became agri-business customers of NAB in 2008. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. And are you aware of the ban on the live export of cattle to Indonesia that was put, play, put in place by the Australian government in about June 2011? Uh, I'm now aware of it, yes. Yes. Um, were you aware of that before this statement? No, I wasn't. All right. Have you um, spoken with any of your agribusiness managers, agribusiness impaired asset managers, about <coughs> that 
aspect of this file, the live, the live export ban? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, have you informed yourself in any way about the live export ban, what happened and the effects of it? Uh, only through reading the file. Okay. Are you prepared to accept that the live export ban was a very significant shock to the Australian cattle market, but in particular to the Queensland cattle market? Are you prepared to accept that? Uh, yes, and from what I heard from Mrs Smith yes. earlier, yes, I do. And even more particularly, I think, in the North Queensland cattle market. Um, you heard Mrs Smith explain that that had an impact on their business? Yes, I did. And by August 2012, the Smiths were in financial difficulty and that led to the business manager making the first referral into SBS? Yes. And that was as a result not just of the live export ban which had created some difficulty for them but for flooding on one of their two properties which prevented them selling. You're aware of that? Yes. And that was rejected but then in November 2012 there was a further referral made by the same banker and this time it was accepted. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, could you take me to the document, please? It's tab 41 of your state first statement. It's NAB 005 481 0001. So this is the referral, I think, that was accepted. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Okay. And then if we go to the second page, 0002. And if that last box could just be popped out, please. So on the form there is this section, Banker's Proposal, including likely to be turnaround or recovery file. Before we go to the text in the box, could you just explain what is meant to happen here in this form? This is something filled out by the, by the client's frontline banker? That's correct. And is this where they express their view about what should happen? Yes, it is. Um, and that means what should happen, what SBS should do? It's a, a recommendation. Right, okay. And so the recommendation here is retain. What does that mean? Um, in SBS terms, that um, the, the client is one that we think can turn around and, um, and ultimately be rehabilitated back to the, the performing book. Okay. It says there that there's been uh, poor account management. Um, fundamental to the core beef cattle operations appear appears to remain viable with increased breeder numbers, favourable season and substantial feed reserves. And then there's some talk of an ATO debt. So this is the banker saying he thinks the business is viable but it should be managed by SBS. Yes. And um, SBS accepted this referral on this occasion. Uh, what should the impaired asset manager that comes into possession of a file with a recommendation like this and the history of the earlier referral that was not accepted do? Um, the, the, the same process of um, trying to establish the, the circumstances and ultimately um, set a strategy of what rehabilitation will look like. And speaking perhaps more generally than just the Smith file at the moment, what are the sorts of options that an impaired asset manager might look to to rehabilitate a client in financial distress? Um, it could be uh, an extension of time or a relaxation of covenants or um, postponement of amortisation. Okay. Um, this form uh, was 
dated the 5th of November 2012. You can see that from the first yes. page. Um, NAB began charging default interest on overdrawn amounts on the overdraft on the 1st of November 2012. So that is four days before this form was submitted. Yes. Now, does the imposition of default interest on overdrawn amounts make it more or less likely that the client's file can be rehabilitated? I think it depends on the individual circumstances. All right. If it's an individual circumstance where cash flow is a current difficulty, would the imposition of a higher rate of interest assist in any way to rehabilitate? Um, it, yeah, it's, it, it wouldn't assist. Um, at the point this file came into SBS, there are a range of options available to the asset manager who took responsibility for the file. Was that a, would that asset manager have had authority to stop default interest being charged on the overdrawn amounts? <coughs> um, I, I don't actually know at that time. What would happen now? Um, now it would be um, a decision by um, one of my direct reports to, uh, to a certain level, depending on the, the level of debt. You need a particular level of authority to waive a particular level of interest? Yes. Um, because one option for a file like this, where there are cash flow problems, some of which are caused by reason of unfortunate circumstances and circumstances outside the control of the borrower, might be, rather than to charge default interest on the overdrawn amounts of the overdraft, to increase the limit of the overdraft to bring it back into water. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, that that's within the um, within the uh, the authority of the of the impaired asset manager. It is whether it's whether it's relevant or not depends on the individual circumstances. Right, but it is within the authority. It, yes. it, it is at least a theoretical option. Yes, you could do that. Um, so one option is to start charging default interest from four days before it goes into SBS. That's a, a real option and it might That's, happen yeah. by automatic process, it I does. suspect. Um, and then it's a matter for SBS to determine whether to continue with the default interest. You agree with that? Yes. It's only SBS that can waive the default interest? Uh, I'm, I, I don't actually know whether the, the business could or not either. Right. Would it surprise At you if time. a file that's under management by SBS, a decision like that could be taken by the business? Uh, no. It, it is, um, the files continue to be managed in conjunction between the business and SBS. Right. Um, all right. So one theoretical option, increase the overdraft facility limit. It's now back in order. And would one consideration... Uh, in making that decision be whether or not you had adequate security to cover the increased limit? Firstly, it would be the viability um, consideration and then secondary to that, the um, security. So in this circumstance where the relationship managers express the opinion that it should be retained and it is a viable business, if the relationship man managers write in that opinion, then would it be right that the next question is, if we bring the overdraft back into water by increasing the facility limit, do we have enough security to cover our position? No, the, the next question to that would be, well, if we increase the, the facility limit, um, how, does the, how does the facility limit ultimately be restored back to the previous level? I see. So does that mean security is not a relevant consideration? No, that it is, but it's, it not, it's not the primary consideration. The primary consideration is whether the business is going to bounce back Yes. But I thought you'd, I'd put the question to you on the basis that the viability assessment recommended by the relationship manager was correct. But that's not, that's not his decision to make? No, no, I understand that. But my, sorry, let me make it quite clear. That's his recommendation to SBS. He's it's, got no decision to make here at all. He just fills out a form to try and refer something to you. It's entirely for you to decide 
whether or not the file is taken. Correct. And he gives you a recommendation, and his recommendation says we should retain the client and they've got a viable business. Yes. And if he's right in that respect, that the business is viable and the client should be retained, then an option that might be attractive to the bank so that it doesn't have an impaired loan and to the customer so that they can continue to get through this difficult patch that they found themselves in is to restore the facility to a higher limit so it is now in order, which avoids default interest and gives them some headspace to get through, some headroom to get through the trouble patch. Do you agree with all of that? Yes, that's an option. All right. And are you aware of whether or not after the file was accepted into SBS, the default interest on the overdraft continued to run? As far as I'm aware, it did. And has it continued to run since? Yes, as far as I'm aware, it has. Since the 1st of November 2013? Yes. All right. Just reflecting on that aspect for now, which is only one aspect of the management of uh, the Smith's file, do you think that, with the benefit of hindsight, um, the application of default interest to the overdraft um, has been to the disadvantage of both the Smiths and the bank? Um, uh, yes, I do. And, and I think that's why, when we, we ultimately got to farm debt mediation, that that matter was addressed. Yes. And is that the appropriate way to address it, to take it to farm debt mediation by serving a notice on the farmer that says that the bank is considering selling the secured property, which happens to be their home? Um, not in itself, no. But I, I, I look at that as part of an overall resolution um, as to what can happen at farm debt mediation. All right. Um, before I go further with that, I just want to quickly take you to... Oh. Commissioner, I have attended the hardship policy. Could I tender that, please? It's NAB 005291001. Exhibit 4.114. Uh, SBS Hardship Procedural, NAB 005-291-001, Exhibit 4.114. Um, Mr McNaughton, in your uh, first statement to the Commission, you mentioned Prudential Standard APS 220. Um, just so you can familiarise yourself, you do that at paragraph 15C. I just want to take you to that document briefly. It's uh, RCD.0022.0005. Seek to give the witness a copy. Yes. For me or for him or for both. Yeah, if you would like a copy, Commissioner, no, I can I've arrange one. I've got one on the screen. Commissioner, please. Um, in paragraph 15C of your statement, your first statement, Mr McNaughton, you say that your responsibilities involve ensuring that bankers within the SBS team comply with this prudential standard. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, I do. All right. And this is a document that you'd be well familiar with? Um, I'm familiar with um, the team, or my responsibility under it. Um, this is a document which imposes a variety of obligations on authorised deposit-taking institutions, um, some of which involve having appropriate credit policies and procedures in place within the bank. Do you agree with that? I do, yes. And um, it relates in large part to impairments. Yes. And how impaired loans are identified and managed. Yes. And that is the heart of what you do and your team does in SBS? It's certainly part of it, yes. Yes. And SBS is probably, in some respects, 
exists within the bank in answer to this prudential standard, which requires banks to have specialist people that manage impaired loans. It's it, it's part of it's part of it. Yes. Are there other prudential standards that you're responsible for? Uh, no, there aren't. No. All right. Um, if we could go to triple zero four. See paragraph seven. It speaks of credit risk being the risk of counterparty default. It usually represents the single largest risk facing an ADI. And the presence of a well-functioning credit risk management system is therefore fundamental to the safety and soundness of an ADI. And where it says there a credit risk management system, is that what ECRS is? Yes, it is. Thank you. And there is a requirement in 8B for proper policies and procedures for the identification and appropriate measurement of impaired facilities. See that? I do, yes. And in E, for the write down or write off of uncollectible facilities. See that? I do. And then if we go to 0007 under the heading recognition of impaired facilities. a requirement to have policies and procedures to ensure the timely and reliable recognition of impaired facilities, incorporating as appropriate the exercise of experienced credit judgment. And the, it might be that the exercise of experienced credit judgment is where SBS comes in. Yes. And then in 24 there is recognition of what an impaired facility is, where there is doubt over the timely collection of the full amount of cash flows contracted to be received by the ADI. Yes. So where the, wherever there is doubt that what has been contracted to be paid to the bank will be paid, the facility could be considered impaired. Yes. And then if we go to 27 on the next page, well, actually perhaps if we go to 26 first, you'll see there's some greater definition of impairment. So it points to some particular events that would constitute doubt about whether or not the bank's going to receive the contract, its contractual entitlements. And one is that the facility is 90 days past due. And that's why in the APRA um, reports, the spreadsheets that I took you to earlier, one of the columns refers to past 90 days due. Yes, that's because that, that, that is the that is, that is a bright line signal for impairment. Yes. All right. And then in 27, where a facility has been identified as impaired, an ADI must raise provisions. Could you explain the concept of raising provisions? <coughs> um, when a when an impaired asset manager has a has a file where it's gone 90 days past due and. Uh, future payment is in doubt, then they should assess the future cash flows um, and security position to um, consider whether the whether the bank is likely to um, uh, the bank's position is likely to result in a loss. All right. And what's the consequence of classifying a file as being impaired? insofar as the bank's cost of capital is concerned? Um, my understanding is that uh, we would hold additional capital. And the fact of the bank holding additional capital, is that a cost to the bank's business? Uh, I'm, I don't know the answer to that, sorry. Right. Um, do you know whether or not there is any relationship between cost of capital as a consequence of impairment in, the char in a bank's decision to charge default interest? No, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer All to right. that. So in your understanding of default interest, just moving away from impairment and cost of capital and moving to the more vanilla question of default interest, why do banks charge default interest? 
Um, I think in Australia it's become customary for banks to include um, default interest in the contract and uh, as an um, incentive to comply with the terms. I see. Given that, do you think that charging default interest for an extended period in circumstances where there is plainly incapacity to pay it is perverse? Uh, no, I don't. How could it possibly serve as an incentive to pay when there is no capacity to pay? Um, I, th I think in, in situations such as the, the Smiths, um, the way that my experience has been the bank has tried to deal with that is through, um, through farm debt mediation, which would result in all or a large element of the default interest over that long period of time being waived or rebated. All right. Well, I'll come to the farm debt mediation in a moment. But before I do that, you explain in your statement, or you set out rather in your statement, the default interest that's been charged to the Smith's account. Do you remember doing that? Yes, I do. All right. And do you have a recollection of the amount of default interest they've been charged so far? Um, can you just take me to that part? Yes. Uh, do you... I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. It's WIT uh, 0001, 000... Uh, sorry, 0069, 0001. And it's at 0041. So, Mr McNaughton, if you're working off the hard copy, this relevantly starts at paragraph 158. This is the explanation of the Smith's current facilities. There's an earlier explanation about overdraft and when it started... Uh, sorry, default interest and when it started being charged on the two facilities. I've already told you that it was 1 November 2012 that the overdraft... Ex uh, default interest was applied to the excess of the overdraft. It was March 2013 when the $3.1 million facility uh, started having default interest applied to it. That's from 147 yes. of your statement. Um, and then you set out here on this page and the next page in the table um, the current balances and interest rates. And you can see um, on the overdraft, NAB is charging 10.92% on balances up to 530 530,000 is the limit that had been approved in 2012 that they went into excess of. Yes. And the facility limit on the overdraft has never been changed at any point since then. So it remains at 530 and is what I understand this to mean that 10.92 is just the standard rate of interest and that is the rate that is applied to the balance uh, within the limit, so the full 530. Is that what you understand that to mean, 10.92%? And then on the balance over the 530, NAB is charging 18.07%. Yes. And the current balance of that overdraft facility in consequence <coughs> is now $1.875 million. Yes, it is. And then there is the... Um, business markets facility, which is over the page on the hard copy. And it doesn't have a limit at the moment. The reason for that is it's expired. Yes. So there is no available limit. Um, and 13.27% is being charged on the entire balance of that, of that facility. Yes, that's correct. And that has led to a balance in that facility of just under $6 million. Correct? Yes, that's correct. And this is the facility that I had referred to um, with Mrs Smith in her evidence as being the $3.1 million facility. Yes, that's correct. That's what the, that's what the previous limit was, $3.1 million. Is that, do you agree with that? Yes. And as a consequence of the interest that's been applied to that, that's now a touch under $6 million. 
This file has been managed by SBS since November 2012. Do you consider it prudent and in the interests of the bank for interest to continue to accrue at those rates on those facilities? Um, no, I don't consider it to be in the interests of the bank. Why not? Um, because it's the, the loan, the facilities have been in long-term default and um, we've sought previously to, um, to resolve the situation with Ms. Mr and Mrs Smith and um, at some future point in time still need to resolve this situation. Do you agree that in the circumstances that have presented themselves to Mr and Mrs Smith, some of which are in their control and many of which are not, that there is just abject unfairness in interest running for so long at such high rates? Um, you know, I think as I've set out in my answer um, to question 31, this, this generally is a difficult situation, yes. even by SBS standards. And um, my, um, my hope and expectation is still that we will resolve the, the situation with Mr and Mrs Smith along the same lines as the previous farm debt mediation, mm -hmm. which will look to address the previous default interest and that that's occurred since then. Whilst, um, whilst giving adequate time. Do you accept that farmers in long-term drought situations are under heightened degrees of stress as a consequence of the situation they find themselves in? Do you accept yes, that do. proposition? Do you think that in circumstances where facilities are in default and drought continues for the extraordinary period that it has continued in this case, that the continued imposition of default interest on the facilities places a <coughs> further burden on the farmers? Yes, it could do. You think it could add to their stress? Yes, I think it could. And do you think that one reaction to stress might be disengagement? Um, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that could occur. Would it surprise you if a person in this situation, with that now that level of indebtedness on facilities that were in 2012, 850 odd thousand and 3.1 million dollars, might find those figures of 1.875 million and 5.937 million just completely overwhelming? Yes, I, I, I think we could, and you know, I, I, as I said previously, I, as I, I, and I tried to um, cover in my statement, the, the situation is is really difficult, um, and I think having heard Mrs. Smith talk earlier, I think it's confronting in terms of the distress that she's she's faced. Um, I also think that. Um, in terms of the, the communication with, with Mrs Smith and my review, um, it could have been more proactive for the bank, uh, by the bank, um, but also there's a, there's a balance in there where we know the drought continues and we don't want to harass Mrs Smith by, and Mr Smith by writing to them frequently. So there is a balance in, in the approach we try and take. Have you um, reviewed the forbearance deed that was agreed to at the farm debt mediation? Yes, I have. All right. Um, and you know that that deed required a number of things of the Smiths, um, one of which was to sell one of the two properties of their choice. So could you take me to the... I, I can. Um, it is NAB. Triple zero, oh, sorry, double zero five four five one one zero two three. Yeah. 
Um, this is the document on the screen. Sorry, which tabs that one? Oh, please? Um, I'm not sure. Is it in the state? No, no, no. Okay, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, sorry, I, I've taken you to the document on the screen that's in Mrs. Smith's statement, but it's 60. It's tab 60 of your statement as well. You can work. You can work on that. It's the, precisely the same document. So you've reviewed this document in preparation to give evidence today. Yes, I have. And um, I was saying to you that there are a number of obligations on the Smiths. Those obligations are set out primarily in Clause 5, which is 1031 of the numbering in the top right-hand corner, or page 8 at the bottom of the deed. And you can see there that they had to, by the 1st of March, commence marketing for sale either Limbury or Oakvale. By the 31st of May, they needed to have a contract for whichever they chose. And by the 30th of June, they had to have completed the sale of the property. Yes. Now, do you accept that as things transpired, it has been impossible for them to comply with those obligations? Uh, yes, I do. And they had other obligations, including to make repayments within time, and those repayments were not made. You understand that? Um, there was some small amount paid, but nothing like the amount that was required by this deed. Correct. And you accept that Mrs. You understand that Mrs. Smith says it was simply impossible for them to make those payments. Um, I, I don't think that's what she said earlier. What, what did you understand? Well, I her evidence understood to be? it as unless there was a, a good. Season. Oh, sorry. I, I don't mean at the time of signing this. I mean as I'm things sorry. transpired. Yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Yes. And yes. do you accept that? Do yes, you accept yeah. that that was the fact? Yes. So from within eight months, nine months of this deal being struck, circumstances had transpired that made it impossible for the Smiths to fulfil the core of their obligations under the deed. You've accepted that? Yes. Now, as things continued to transpire, it became even less likely that they would be able to comply, didn't it? Because the drought continued yes, it for did. far longer than anybody would have foreseen. Yes. So my question now is, what should SBS do in those circumstances? By the middle of 2014, it was clear that Limbrae could not be sold and Oakvale was struggling as well. Didn't something need to be done at that point? Um, well, from my review of the file, we, we waited um, and waited hoping that it would rain. And, and if that had occurred, again, from my review, um, then it would have been the intention to um, re-engage with, with Mr and Mrs Smith. Do you appreciate that there's a material difference, at least so far as the Smiths are concerned, between waiting and applying default interest and waiting and not applying default interest? Yes, I understand that. And, um, do you think that it would have been in the interests of the bank if it had stopped applying default interest in 2014? Um, in, sorry, in what sense? In the sense that, it, as I understand it, the bank agreed by the deed of forbearance that default interest would be rebated in effect. Yes. Subject to compliance by the Smiths with their obligations. Yes. Nature frustrated the ability of the Smiths to comply with their obligations. Yes. You've accepted agreed. that. Wasn't the fair thing to do in those circumstances not to impose default interest? in circumstances where it was completely outside the control of the Smiths? Um, I, I, that, that, I think, is, is where, um, where we were always likely to get back to, in a sense that we entered the initial forbearance deed that would do as you've described, and um, when, the, when the weather broke, um, my review of the file um, suggested me that we would we would still aim to get back to the same point. That's something known to you but not known to them, isn't it? That's correct. So while you are aware of that, 
they're on the farm with cattle they can barely feed and default interest running at very high rates. Aren't they? Yes. Do you think that the community would have an expectation on the bank in those circumstances to communicate what you know to the Smiths frankly and fairly? I think as I set out in my statement, um, I, I think we could have been more proactive in our communication, but it's a balance between writing to the Smiths regularly when we know it's still in drought and we know the situation is, to our best of our knowledge, not changed, and uh, and and you know communicating that default interest continues to accrue, but we you know we wish to. Um, re-engage in a farm debt mediation. In your statement, what you're referring to is paragraphs 174 and 175, I think. You say NAB could have potentially done more in its communications with the Smiths in the period after their default under the forbearance deed in one respect. I think NAB could have been more proactive in taking steps to ensure that the Smiths and their advisers were conscious of the practical consequences to the Smiths should their default under their facilities continue, particularly with respect to the accrual of what is now substantial default interest. Is that the paragraph that you're referring to? Yes, it is. My question to you is not, do you think you should have communicated to the Smiths better that you are charging default interest, which seems to be the point that you're getting to there. My point is, in circumstances where you have said that you expect that the bank would ultimately waive it at a further farm debt mediation, shouldn't you have just stopped charging it and told them that? Um, I think it always had to be part of the overall resolution to the situation. But what good is served from continuing to apply default interest that will almost certainly not be paid and adding to the stress and burden of people that are already subsisting in a horribly difficult situation as things stand? Yes, I, I don't think there is any, any good in that. You speak, Mr McNaughton, of sending them letters. Where's the nearest branch? Uh, Huendon Commissioner. Yeah. Would it be possible for the manager to go out and see him with a set of instructions in his, her back pocket about what he or she is to tell them? Yes, that would be possible. In that connection, Mr McNaughton, towards the end of her evidence, I asked Mrs Smith if she was aware of the names of two NAB officers. Did you hear me ask her that? I didn't, actually, because the, um, the internet cut out when I was watching. We'd prefer it if you didn't say that when you're in the witness box. <laughs> um, or at all. <laughs> We'd prefer it if you didn't have the occasion to say it. Um, we're trying to fix that. Um, I asked Mrs Smith if she was if she was aware of or had spoken to Dale McDowell or Grant Bloomfield. Are they names that you can recall putting into your statement? They are, yes. Yes. Um, they are the names that you set out in paragraph 66. Perhaps that paragraph could be brought up in um, <coughs> Mr McDowell's statement. It's WIT. 0001 0069 0001. <coughs> and it's um, <clears throat> the table on paragraph 66, which is on the uh, 0024. It's a relevant part of the table. Uh, sorry, 2 3. Uh, sorry, it's one earlier than that again. Paragraph 66. One more. Thank you. 
Can you see there? This is in a table that is in your statement in answer to a question. Question 13 was who was the Smiths relationship manager when they first became clients of the bank? And you've answered that at paragraph 65. And question 14 is for each of the Smiths relationship managers, how long had they been a relationship manager? How long had they been employed by the bank? And how long had they been involved in agricultural lending? And your answer was that between December 2014 and March 2017, Mr Bloomfield was the relationship manager. And that from May 2017, <coughs> Mr McDowell is the relationship manager of Mrs Smith. Were you surprised to hear her say she's never heard of either of them? Uh, yes, I was. Is that acceptable? It's not what... It's not what I would usually expect, although I am aware um, from the review of the file that there were notices um, posted um, at one of the properties um, where um, access was by invitation only. Yes. And trespass applied. Who is currently responsible for managing the Smiths file within SBS? It's um, Bruce Starkey. Okay. And he's been responsible for managing the file since the first farm debt mediation? Yes, he has been. All right. Has he put this file in the too hard basket? No, I don't believe he has. Do you think that he should be engaging with the local managers and the Smiths? Uh, yes, I do. And. Is that something you've spoken to him about since you reviewed this file? Um, I've discussed with him um, the, what's occurred over the last um, few years in terms of that engagement with either the local banker or with the Smiths. Why hasn't the NAB enforced any of its securities? We, we don't want to take um, possession of, of the property. It's, it's not, we never want to in any situation. Sometimes it ultimately happens. In this case, um, as we tried to at farm debt mediation, we had the desire and, and hope that the Smiths would remain on the farm. Mm -hmm. And we've, we hoped that would find a route through. And that's still exactly the same now that we, we hope that we can reach a resolution whereby the Smiths um, stay on the farm and find a way through to um, uh, reduce the debt through, um, through uh, cash flow. Do you think that if the bank had taken possession of the property after the Smiths had defaulted on their obligations under the deed of forbearance, that it would have been just as hard for the bank to find a buyer for Limbri? Yes, I would expect so. And the reason for that is in heavily droughted country, nobody's buying. That's my understanding, yes. So the bank's in a difficult situation here because even if it wanted to enforce, the reality is it's not going to be able to realise the asset. Um, I, yes, I, I think that would be the case. And isn't that just a further reason why the bank shouldn't have continued to apply default interest? The bank was charging default interest to the Smiths for failure to sell a property that the bank itself could not sell. Um, well, we, you know, we, we didn't want to take possession of the property to, to sell it. And in terms of the default interest, um, I, I, I think it was always an expectation that that would be resolved once the drought broke and once we got back to farm debt mediation. Why didn't you want to enforce the mortgage? Because we didn't want to take possession of the properties. Why? Because we wanted the you know, we wanted to find a solution whereby the Smiths remained on the property. Right. Can I show you another document? It's NAB one four eight double zero three three seven two eight. will be on the screen. It's not okay. in. It's not in any folder, but it's okay. only a short document. You, you may. And I'm only going to take you to one line, so you, you may avoid the need for a hard copy. Oh, you're you're getting one anyway. 
thank you. This is an email chain between Mr. Avent and Mr. Starkey in November 2014. So to put this email in context, it's after default in the performance of the Smith's obligations under the forbearance deed. Uh, and while default interest is running. And further below there is a um, discussion between Mr Starkey and some other people. Is the version that you've got redacted or is it just highlighted in blue? Just highly. So blue. you can see the names of the people in the email chain at the bottom there? Yes, I can. Right. Do you know who any of those people are? The email chain between... Um, Bruce Starkey and, and Jeff Howard yes, and John C. Oh, John Advent, John Advent and yes. Jeff Howard, I see. And then if you go over the page to 3729, this is Bruce Starkey who currently manages and has at all times managed the Smith's file from SBS talking about available options in circumstances where they have defaulted. Yes. And can you see here, it says um, just after the first large paragraph at the top of the page, options without the detail under each option. One, appoint R&M. Do you understand that to mean receiver and manager? I do, yes. Appoint receiver and manager now. And it says in brackets under it, not acceptable due to the drought and political environment. Yes. And then number two is, allow the customer to stay in control of the assets and appoint receiver and manager when it rains. Yes. That's what the bank was contemplating in 2014. Um, I, I don't know that that's what they were contemplating well, as an option. The, as the options. Yes. Yes. And it says in the brackets under that, um, if we're to do this, we'll need to be very open about the customer, with the customer's advisors about this now, otherwise the ultimate political consequence will be severe, probably as politically unacceptable as one above. You see that? Yes, I do. And then 2B is allow the customers to trade the business on an attempt refinance. Not acceptable to NAB, as our debt is likely to escalate. No control over the livestock, no likely exit of the relationship. And then C is allow the customers a very short period after it rains, say three months, to either sell or refinance. And there's a comment, given the political environment, I think we need to look at this, but only if we can get some controls in place. There is also the disadvantage of having gone through the mediation process, having drawn the line in the sand, and when they don't, ensuring the customers live up to the agreement. However, they have the excuse of drought. Do you think um, drought's a complete answer to their failure to perform their obligations under the deed, at least insofar as sale of Limbury is concerned? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. And NAB, do you accept that there is nothing in this email that reveals any desire on the part of NAB to keep the Smiths in the property? This is a hard-nosed assessment of the options available to NAB, but there's no desire expressed as to the position of the Smiths. Yes, I think that's correct. And the two reasons given as to why the bank wouldn't appoint a receiver and manager uh, because of the drought is on and the political environment. Yes. And similarly, there was the risk of um, political consequences if the bank waited for it to rain and then appointed. Yes, that's what it says. But there's nothing proactive in this email about <coughs> how to get things on an even keel. This well, is just, just considering enforcement. I know it doesn't just consider enforcement. Uh, an exit. Yes. Thank you. And um, if I could now take you to NA, oh, could I tender that, Commissioner? There was 4.115 emails between our event uh, Starkey and others, 10 November 14, NAB 148 uh, 
Could I now show you NAB.148.020.2380? This is a much more recent uh, email between uh, somebody called Ashley Smith, who is no relation to the Smiths, and Mr Starkey. And you can see there that in January... Um, sorry, I, I should take you, in fairness, to the second page first, which is 2381. And there's a there's a hard copy coming, Mr. Right there. No, thank you. Um, on the second page there, this is Mr. Smith emailing Mr. Starkey. He's almost finished this one. Do you, do you think this is a review of the Smith's file? Is that what he means? Uh, I'm sorry, I I don't know. Okay, my take is that the file is 99. That's an ECRS rating, do you think? Yes, it is. Because the deed after the farm debt mediation provided that we would not charge default rates, i.e. we will not recover all interest in IAS. What's the IAS? It's our um, impaired asset system where we would, uh, we would record provisions. So this is an acknowledgement of the fact that the bank... So this is a recording of the fact that the banks in the bank's own systems it doesn't expect to recover the interest. Yes. I see. Given that the customers have not met their obligations to sell, etc. in 2014, are we now entitled to charge and recover default rates? I.e. should this be ECRS 98? Let me know because it impacts on a couple of questions in the assurance. So what's this process do you think that Mr Smith's going through? Um, I think what he's referring to is, uh, um, is a self-assurance process that operates in SBS, whereby one impaired asset manager will review another manager's file um, around uh, it's a pro forma check. Right. And so when Mr Smith says, given that the customers have not met their obligations to sell, etc., in 2014, are we now entitled to charge and recover default rates? Is he labouring under a misapprehension as to what has happened with default interest? Uh, yes, he will be. So he's reviewed the file, but he hasn't realised default interest has been charged since 2012 on one facility and 2013 on the other? Yes, I, I believe see. so. I see. And so, um, and he says, if we were to... To paraphrase him, if we were to charge default interest, it would become ECRS 98. That's is that right? Yes. So is, does that mean that currently the Smith <coughs> file is ECRS 98? Uh, no, my understanding is it's ECRS 99. So it's ECRS 99, which means, apart from other things, that the bank has accepted it won't recover the interest? Yes, that's correct. OK. Um, and then Mr Starkey responds, <coughs> while there is on the next page. <coughs> Go up a page rather than down a page. Is that right? Uh, 2380. Yes. yes. The first page of that document. Hi Ashley, while there is probably a legal right to now recover our full debt, including default interest, there is virtually no chance that we will, as a result of the politics stemming from the five year drought and the potential impact on bank image. Is it a concern to protect NAB's reputation that drives these decisions? Not in itself, no. It's one consideration? Yes, it will be. Is it the predominant consideration? I don't believe so. Do you accept that in this email, and by all means read the balance of it if you'd like to satisfy yourself, that there is nothing that Mr Starkey points to save for politics stemming from the five-year drought and the potential impact on the bank image 
that comes into his consideration as to the appropriate way to deal with this very difficult file. Yeah, that, the, the things you've highlighted are the only things that are in the statement that Mr Starkey sends. And that is consonant with some of the statements made by the same gentleman in 2014 in respect of the same file. Do you accept that? Yes, I do. So is the reason that NAB hasn't enforced this mortgage that it doesn't want to incur the political opprobrium that will come from enforcing it? No, I don't believe so. So Mr Starkey here, who is the man charged with managing the file, clearly had it at front of mind in 2014. He had it at front of mind in January 2017, but you don't think that that is why the decision has been taken not to enforce? No, I don't. But why do you think their decision was taken not to enforce? Because, I, as I've said, I, I think this is, this is a difficult file, and I think that we still want to get to a point where we resolve the position with the Smiths through most likely a farm debt mediation. And we've taken no steps over that period to enforce our rights under our, our charges. Well, quite. My point is directed entirely to the reasons why you haven't. Do you understand? My question was, why have you not enforced? And is the reason you have not enforced the reasons Mr Starkey pointed to in 2014 and 2017? No, I don't believe so. And what is the basis of that belief? That we wanted to get to a resolution with them. When you say we wanted to get to a resolution... Yeah. Which, which results in what we tried to achieve under the farm debt mediation and the deed of forbearance where the Smiths would remain on the farm. Is that what you want? Absolutely. And is it what anybody but you wants? No, I don't believe so. I, I, I believe that's consistent with others across SBS. And um, why do you have that belief? Because no enforcement action has been taken. Yes, but um, it's getting rather circular. The premise of the question is that no enforcement action has been taken. Yeah. I've shown you two emails from the person who manages the file that's pointed to the difficulty in taking enforcement action because the bank's reputation might be damaged if it were to do so. And the question that I've put to you twice now is, is that the reason the bank hasn't enforced? And as I understand it, your answer is, no, the bank hasn't enforced because it wants the Smiths to remain on the farm. Yes. And my second question to you then is, what is the basis of your belief that that is the reason that the bank hasn't enforced in the face of the two emails I've showed you? Over the, over the period um, that, we're, that we're considering here, I'm aware um, that there have been other enforcement actions taken um, for other other customers, um, and the the fact that the in this case enforcement action hasn't been taken hasn't been taken sorry isn't to my mind because of solely a political motivation. Do you think that in all of the circumstances that have uh, struck the Smiths? that if a new deal was done, it would be fair to require them to divest both properties? No, I don't. Do you think that it would be fair to require them to destock both properties? No, I don't. Do you accept that the only way this can be fairly resolved is for the Smiths to remain in possession of a property and to have cattle from which they can earn an income? Absolutely. And is that something that NAB will work towards? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr McNaughton. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Um, just a few questions in the examination. Um, Mr McNaughton, uh, do you recall being asked some questions I'm about... Terribly sorry to interrupt yes. you, Mr uh, Thomas. Uh, the last email chain, I think, was not tendered. In uh, uh, emails, Ashley Smith to Sharkey, 11 January 17. NAB 1480202380, Exhibit 4.116. Uh, and uh, while I'm on my feet, Commissioner, um, consistent with my conduct all day today, I didn't te uh, tender the APRA prudential standard that I took Mr McNaughton to. It is RCD.0022.0005,
dot triple zero one, and it is described as all standard APS two twenty with that doc ID as exhibit four point one one seven. Thank you. And having twice interrupted you, Mr. Thomas. Now, <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Morton, uh, do you recall being asked some questions about uh, a document entitled the SBS Hardship Procedural? Yes, I do. Um, that is for the transcript exhibit 4.114. Um, Can I um, ask you to look at two different documents, if I could? Thank you. The first of those documents is NAB dot one oh six dot double oh one dot oh six seven four Mr McNaughton this should be a document uh, uh, with the heading HAR one oh one dot one do you yes. have that in front of you I do um, is this a document that applies uh, to bankers within SBS yes it is thank you um, could I then ask you to turn to the next document? Uh, the docket ID is NAB.106.001.0673. Do you have that document in front of you? I do, yes. Is this a document that also applies to bankers within SBS? It does, yes. Thank you. Um, do you recall being asked questions by my friend uh, are we tendering those? I tender Mr. both Thomas. of those documents, Commissioner. Uh, first one, financial hardship document, HAR 101.1, .1, NAB 106001 becomes Exhibit uh, 4.118. Second document, hardship notice, HAR 102, NAB 106001 Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. McMorden, do you recall being asked questions by my friend about the possibility of the bank increasing the overdraft limit to, quote, regularise the overdraft facility, close quote? Yes, I do. Um, do you recall whether or not the bank had previously increased the overdraft limit of the overdraft facility provided to the Smiths? Yes, I recall that occurred in August of 2013. And do you agree with me that it actually occurred on four separate occasions, as set out in your statement at paragraph 68A? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, the third um, issue I wanted briefly to raise, Mr McNaughton, is in answer to a question from the Commissioner, you referred to notices uh, that were on one of the properties. Uh, can I just clarify um, and, and ask uh, if the following document could be brought up? NAB.148. Dot o one four dot one seven o six Mr. Gnorton, is this uh, the notice uh, to which you're referring in answer to the Commissioner? Yes, it is. And uh, are you aware of the, the person uh, who took that notice? Or uh, took that photograph? Uh, yes, I am. And is that an employee, was that an employee of NAB? Yes, it was. Do you know whether that employee, having taken that notice, proceeded to enter the property? I'm, uh, I'm not aware that they did. Thank you. Um, um, are you aware which of the two properties um, this photograph relates to? No, I'm not. Fine. Or when it relates to? Um, what time? It is otherwise dealt with in um, Mr McNaughton's evidence, yes. and so there will, the record will show uh, the date upon which the I photograph was taken. I find the date out of that. Yes, indeed. Yes, thank you. Mr. And we will assist you in submissions, Commissioner, in relation to that matter. Um, because it's already exhibited to Mr McNaughton's statement, then I don't no, need to tender the document. We don't need to tender it. Uh, no further questions, Commissioner. Yes, thank you, Mr Thomas. Um, Mr McNaughton, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Uh, about that, I think, is... Uh, there are no further the witnesses for today.
the agricultural uh, finance aspect will continue in Darwin on Monday with a case study uh, concerning Rural Bank before then moving to the second topic for this hearing block. So if we adjourn till 10 a.m. Uh, on Monday next in Darwin. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you.